So welcome back. Now we will look at the quantification of oral stenosis and the most important tools are planimetry, the pressure gradients and the assessment of the AV velocity. It would be great if we could directly measure the aortic valve area. However, very often it's difficult to visualize the actual orifice of the aortic valve because the valve is heavily calcified, for example, and there can be a lot of shadowing and artifacts. Importantly, however, we also have to remember that the effective orifice area of the valve is not necessarily the anatomic or so-called geometric area. Due to the pressure and turbulence development at the stenotic valve, and we should also consider that the calcified valve can also be funnel-like and so it's difficult to assess the actual narrowest part of the valve. However, planimetry can be very useful in cases where example Doppler gradients are unreliable or unavailable and we can use it as an add-on to the other parameters in unclear cases. So as we discussed earlier, the most important thing is to assess the gradients for the severity of aortic stenosis. It's important to note, however, that we do not measure directly the gradients, but we have to measure the velocity, and by using the Bernoulli equation, we can then calculate the gradients. So let's dig a little bit deeper. So in heart catheterization or with Doppler, we can actually measure the pressure gradient or pressure difference between the left ventricle and the aorta ascendants. Now look at the high pressure the left ventricle has to achieve to get a normal blood pressure in the aorta ascendants if you have severe aortic stenosis. So this is actually the pressure gradient. In Doppler, we are actually measuring the aortic valve velocity and there is a rapid increase in aortic velocity once the aortic valve area gets below 2 to 2.5 square centimeters and we can see an exponential increase as the valve gets smaller. So in the cath lab we can directly measure the pressures in the left ventricle and in the aorta, either simultaneously or by pullback method of the catheter. These are the simultaneous tracings of the left ventricle, look at the high pressure here, and the, in the aorta. Actually the peak to peak gradient, what is frequently measured in the cath lab, is not a physiological or real measurement. It does not present the actual pressure of the left ventricle and aorta at the same time. And it's very important to consider that it is usually lower than the maximum or peak instantaneous gradient which is measured by Doppler echo. Also we can calculate a mean gradient in the cath lab. From the peak velocity at the aortic valve using Doppler echo we can easily determine the maximum gradient over the valve by using the so-called Bernoulli equation, which is four times the velocity square. So you don't have to remember this because the eco machines will calculate this automatically. But it is important to know that the velocity is influenced by the heart rate and importantly by the stroke volume. So if you have low output, of the heart, we will find lower velocity and also low gradients. This is a typical example of the Doppler spect spectrum in aortic stenosis, showing a velocity above 4 meters per second, indicating severe aortic stenosis. So the shape of the spectrum and time to peak also points to the severity of aortic stenosis. If there is a later peak of velocity or a longer time to peak in systole, this 
indicates severe aortic stenosis, as you can see on the right side of this image. Now let's see how we record such a signal. To quantify aortic stenosis with CV Doppler, I would start from the apical approach. And I would try to get an apical five chamber view and place the continuous wave Doppler spectrum right inside the valve. Now, it's very important to also put the focus point exactly where the valve is. Now, you can see the spectrum here is not very good. So you can optimize the signal by moving your transducer further lateral and then you have a much better angle to the ultrasound beam and you are really parallel and this way you will usually get much higher gradients than if you use the classical five chamber view and in this case you also get a much better spectrum so from this position I would then wait to see if I get a beat which is high and then I could measure the gradients also very important to see that you get the LVOT within the curve. First of all, this gives you information if you really have the signal of the aortic valve. And second of all, it's usually a sign that you are in an optimal position with your Doppler spectrum. In the next demo, let's look at what we can actually do with the acquired tracing of the Doppler spectrum and what information that can give us for the quantification of the severity of auric stenosis. So once you have the optimal signal and you think you have the maximum velocity, you freeze the curve and then we optimize also the time axis. This gives us higher accuracy when we quantify the gradients. Then we look for the beat where we think we have the maximum velocity and then we perform a trace around the curve beginning with aortic valve opening. So we trace the contours of this curve. Try not to include portions of the curve which are artifacts. And then we go all the way towards closure of the aortic valve. And then we get the following measurements. We have a mean gradient of 40 millimeters mercury and a maximum velocity of 4.1 meters per second. As you just saw in the demonstration, it's very important that when you examine a patient, you get a good jet alignment of the Doppler jet to the aortic valve velocity stream. So to achieve that, we have to use several Doppler windows. We always start with the apical view and then you turn to the right parasternal and finally you can try the suprasternal window to get the maximum velocity because remember the gradients are calculated from the maximum velocity so if we don't find the maximum jet we will have too low gradients so we have to try to keep the Doppler angle as low as possible to get the lowest velocity error let's look at another demo to quantify aortic stenosis from a right personal approach, we also need the pencil probe. It is also important to position the patient in a position where he's turned as far as possible towards the right. And then we have to remember what the anatomy of the heart is and where we can actually expect the jet to be or to go. So the heart is here on the left side and the jet can go in many directions. It can go further, fairly flat, but it can also go fairly steep towards the head. So we have to try more positions and more windows and try to see where we get the optimal signal and the maximal velocity. So we'll start with the position where we're located in the third intercostal space. So on here we see a signal which is the aortic valve but not in a very good quality. So I will now tilt the transducer more cranial and the signal improves. Small motions and the velocity is somewhere in the region of maybe 4.5 meters but we do not know if this is really the maximum velocity. So I will now move more cranial with my transducer position and again adjust the transducer
It's very important to also listen to the signal because this gives you more information where you actually are than sometimes just looking at the image. And here you can see that the maximum velocity is now higher than what we had before. And here we have a signal now which is almost six meters. So in conclusion, very important first to put the patient in a right position as far as possible, second to listen to the signal, small motions, and to try more than one transducer position. There are some pitfalls. Uh, oldic stenosis and mitral regurg regurgitation signals can sometimes be mistaken. So watch out especially for medial MR jets because they have the same direction. You can sometimes mistake them as both are of course systolic jets. However, there are some typical differences. So, aortic stenosis versus mitral regurgitation character characteristics. Timing is different, for example. Mitral regurgitation is longer in duration, starting with the mitral valve closure and ending with the mitral valve opening. And looking at the signal of the aortic stenosis compared to MR, the aortic stenosis has a more dagger-shaped signal whereas the mitral regurgitation is rounder in shape. Look here. Usually also, the, in, in severe aortic stenosis, you have a more dense signal. And furthermore, you can frequently see the LVOT Doppler signal in the contour here in the Doppler spectrum of the aortic stenosis signal. So now we have to look at some math. To calculate the aortic valve, this is based on the continuity equation, which takes the fact that the relation of area and velocity always stays the same before and in the stenosis. So we can calculate the area by simply measuring diameter and multiplying by pi. So what do we have to do? All we have to do actually is measure the LVOT, the left ventricular outflow tract diameter, which is usually done in the parasternal view. Then we have to measure the LVOT velocity by pulsed wave Doppler in the five chamber view. And finally, the aortic valve velocity, of course, by continuous wave Doppler in the five chamber view and put all of this into the equation. So from theory to practice, now let's see how to really acquire the parameters you need to calculate the continuity equation. And Tommy will now show you how to do this. To quantify the aortic valve area with the help of the continuity equation, we start from a parasternal approach because we first of all need the diameter of the LVOT. So we'll optimize our image here. It's important to get the aortic valve as large as possible on the screen to reduce the measurement error. Then to optimize the LVOT, freeze the image, then we have to choose the frame where the aortic valve is open and then we take the diameter of the LVOT right at the insertion of the aortic valve. And in this case we get a very wide LVOT of 34 millimeters. To measure the LVOT velocity we use a parasternal five chamber view Again, we place the sample volume in the region of the LVOT. And, so, and then we slowly move the sample volume down into the valve. And you will see that we get a much higher velocity within the valve. That's the stenosis. And then we move back to the point where the velocity is, again, not as high. And this is the region where we're just 
exactly below the aortic valve. And this is also the region where we measure the LVOT diameter. We freeze the image, and then we simply trace the LVOT curve and use that together with the maximum velocity, which we already measured, of the aortic valve to calculate the uh, aortic valve area. There are some limitations to the continuity equation, and you just saw in the demonstration that we have to be very exact about how we obtain the measurements. It's crucial to get a very correct measurement of the LVOT diameter, because remember, the, in the calculation, we have a squaring of the radius. And so if we have errors here, we will have incorrect valve areas. Furthermore, the geometry of the LVOT is not always round. It can be oval. And then, of course, we will measure a too wide or too small diameter. Then we don't always know where we have the PW sample volume in the LVOT. It might not be the same as where the diameter was taken in the parasternal view. The flow profile in the LVOT, of course, is very important because if you have, for example, aortic regurgitation or turbulences in a hypertrophic septum or in hypertrophic obstruction in the LVOT, then we can have a wrong measurement of the LVOT velocity. And finally, it's very important to remember to use several windows to get the highest AV peak velocity so that we don't underestimate the velocity and get a wrong, in this case, too high aortic valve area. So why do we need all these measurements? We can put it all together into context clinically and for the prognosis of the patients, taking this table of the grading of aortic stenosis. It's very important to know if the patient has severe aortic stenosis. So if we have a mean gradient above 40, a valve area below 1 square centimeter, and a jet velocity above 4 meters per second, the patient is classified as having severe aortic stenosis and needs close follow-up. So today, ECO is really the gold standard and reliably can be used to quantify aortic stenosis. And we have to assess the mean and maximum pressure gradients, the aortic valve velocity using several Doppler windows. And finally, we can calculate the aortic valve area reliably in ECO. So in my experience, it's very important to really take your time when examining patients with aortic stenosis. Over and over, we see that patients are referred with mild or moderate aortic stenosis. And when we really sit down and try to find the optimal window for the tracing of the Doppler gradient, we find that actually the patient has severe aortic stenosis. And this is very important for the outcome and the further management of the patient.